welcome to today's episode of the Made for More podcast. I am so excited for our guest joining us today. Mark, welcome. Hello. How are you? Hi, Ellie. Thanks for having me on. Really excited to talk to you today. Great. I'm excited to have you here. And uh, we met uh, originally through a Coffee with PK. If you're in Adelaide, check out uh, Coffee with PK and got chatting outside of that little networking um, event. And I'm just fascinated uh, with the work that you do, you know, both at work and outside of work. So I thought it would be a really good opportunity to have you on the show and unpack some of this uh, really cool stuff that you are doing at Isobar. So before we get too far into that, tell me a little bit about where you have come from and where you're going. Right. Um, look, the first bit I can definitely talk to, the, the where I'm going bit, I, I have absolutely no idea, but um, that's the exciting thing. So I, um, I started my career in creative industry in Adelaide. Um, you know, I had, this, I had this fantastic thought that a friend at the time was, was heading up a VFX agency called Rising Sun Pictures. And he said, hey, do you want to come and do cool stuff in visual effects for Hollywood films? And I thought, yeah, that sounds amazing. And, you know, I'd done, I'd done some study in, in art and design and um, I was really into you know, emerging tech uh, computers back then. And I thought this is going to be fantastic. And the reality was, you know, sitting in a, a dark room, rotoscoping um, stuff for hours on end. It, it was anything but creative or glamorous. It was, it was really production driven. But... Um, it gave me a really good appreciation of being on the inside of what at that point was a really, really small business and understanding how it scaled, how it went after work that was that was too big um, for the size of the company, but just worked their asses off to, to deliver it and, and hired when they could. Um, and that gave me a really, a really, really, um, I guess, good appetite for being in the trenches um, for, for affecting change from from the inside out. So I mm-hmm. guess I've, I've never really been attracted to sitting in a desk in a large corporate, um, but much more towards, you know, how do I how do I change stuff? How do I learn stuff on the fly? How do I get into high pressure situations? Um, so production wasn't for me. Visual effects is is fantastic. And I, I've just, I've got so much respect for, for the people that work in that industry. Um, still very close to a lot of them, but I, I think my natural leaning was more to creativity. So I ended up um, as a graphic designer and then an art director working a few of the ad agencies in Adelaide. And um, I just, I, I hit this point where it was, it was fantastic visualizing ideas. It was fantastic bringing ideas to life um, through, through art and craft, but there was a really big part of me that wanted to generate those ideas in the first place and have a little more control over those strategic conversations with clients. So that's when we moved to Sydney and I, I made the jump from art direction to uh, copywriting. Yeah, cool. I then worked my way from you know copywriter to creative director to group head and then got to the point where, you know, you, you go through three or four redundancies, which is, pretty much par for the course in right. creative industry. Yeah, uh, hashtag resilience. Yeah, right. But it, yeah. it's, it's great in that it, it does teach you resilience. It does teach you how to pivot. Um, and for me, the writing was, was very much on the wall. Yeah. I was becoming too old and too expensive. There were you know, plenty of really talented creatives who were just coming out of award school who could do twice the amount of work for half the price. Um, and I guess for me, it, the joy of creativity um, had been dampened somewhat. Yeah, um, right. Working, working at that level and, and, and managing really large pieces of business, it does become a little bit more of a business. Um, yeah. And so it was a, there was this frustration of, look, I can't be a creative and a business person 100% of the time. Yeah. Um, I've got to make a call. Which way am I going to go? Yeah. Um, so I decided business, you know, was was yeah. the way I was going to focus. But I didn't want to walk into a large corporate. As I said before, I, it's never felt like somewhere I'd, I'd fit. Um, but I did find a role with a global consulting group, um, Capgemini. They were setting up a 
um, a service design practice in Australia, which was being born off this history they had with service design in France, um, which is where they're headquartered. So that for me was kind of the best of both worlds because I, I got to do the scale up stuff and the startup stuff. I got to do the creative stuff and the problem solving, but also the business um, side of things as well. So it was this perfect storm. And, and that was great um, for a couple of years. I, I helped uh, expand that business across uh, Europe, um, Asia and um, Australia. And that was, it was fun. It's, it taught me a lot. Yeah. One of the things it taught me was um, I'm not really great at conforming. <laughs> and in a large French consultancy, or consultancy full stop. Um, I think they're changing a little bit now, but but at the time, I just I didn't feel that I had enough autonomy to be successful. I wasn't set up for mm. success, mm. so mm. Um, I went into startup, um, pure and, and proper, with a financial technology product, and you know that was probably the the year and a half of my life that I just, I can't recall because it was just, (laughs) (laughs) it's it's like every time you put out a fire, there are five more. And, you know, I, I was used to, to developing strategies that you'd roll out over 12 months Yeah. in FinTech and startup, you're writing strategies that last a week. Yeah. And then you're having to rewrite them and re-implement them. And, you know, we had a large development um, center in Auckland. So there was travel between, Auckland and Sydney and you know, that was the time of the Royal Commission and we had a right. huge demerger with one of our clients and you know spinning up a whole bunch of new products that you know were, were brand new to market so it was just incredibly intense and I think for people that have the metal to do that yeah. for years on end mm. more power to you mm. um, for me I guess it it was an opportunity to learn an intense Hence, amount in a really short space of time, yeah. and figure out the things that I love: um, people, solving business problems; the things yeah. that I don't love, <laughs> understanding code and financial technology platforms, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, and focus focus on those things that I do love, which is where Isobar came into the picture. And the role didn't really exist when I started talking to them. I pretty much gave them the rundown I've just given you. you know, here are the things I'm really interested in. Yep. My career has been designed, if you like, in inverted commas by things I find interesting. So, hey, let's go do that for a bit and let's get as smart as we can, as fast as we can in that thing. Yeah. Um, and then when the next thing comes along that we're really, really interested in, let's just go full tilt into that. Um, and that pretty much was kind of the, the prerequisite for what I'm now um, heading up at Isobar, which is strategic design, which really is as many different disciplines as you can possibly gather and understanding which ones do you use when and why to solve which client problem or create which client opportunity. So that's, that's how I got to here. What comes next? I have no idea. We'll see. Watch this space. Yeah, that's right. Um, I think this is really interesting and I think that your journey is just you know it's so amazing where you've gone from one step to the next and um, something that sort of you know stuck out for me just now when you were talking is that real what we're hearing more and more now is that entrepreneurial thinking when you're an employee so how do you solve problems how can you get in like muck in and um, you know just pitch in get the work done and it's interesting I think that throughout and I, and I whenever I interview people for the um, for the show it's really interesting hearing people's you know peaks and troughs along their career but I think it's very similar to how we get people in our life for a season and a reason I think we need to go through a lot of these career journeys do different jobs throw our hat in the ring for all different things because it's all of this you know layer upon layer of experiences life experiences work experiences and I think yours is uh, um, incredible and so now that you're the head of strategic design at Isobar and we had a little chuckle before I hit record on this, but let's talk a little bit about, uh, you know, if you work in corporate, you have probably seen some kind of uh, strategic plan that's got, you know, innovation in it. Uh, yeah. It's going to have stuff around resilience. We know that problem solving is a huge, uh, huge problem or a huge, I guess, opportunity. I'm, I'm a big problem solver as well. I, I get quite a kick out of um, solving problems. You get to do it all day for your work or have a team that does it with you. Let's talk a little bit around, you know, 
what is innovation, what is design thinking, um, and how you're, you know, I guess aligning strategic strategic thinking, strategic direction along with that design aspect as well, because that's quite a unique value proposition that you yeah. now find yourself in. Look, I think it's it's really hard to sort the wheat from the chaff when it comes to, you know, all these buzz, buzzwords. And I was having a chat with mum and dad over Christmas and trying to explain to them what it is that I, <laughs> that I do. Yep. Um, and I guess the, the simplest way for my articulation anyway, and this is the thing, everyone's going to have a slightly different definition. But if we start with something like design thinking that is probably, um, you know, very, very familiar to a lot of your listeners in terms of a term they've heard or a process that they're aware of, um, it was really brought into prominence by, by IDEO. And the only reason that it's become a thing is because they turned it into a product. I mean, it is very much at the core of what creative problem solving is. All they've done is put a framework around it, systematize it, put a name on it and charge people to learn. Um, <laughs> you know, and, you know, and in doing that, I think, you know, that's, that's fantastic. They've created a whole industry. Um, and if, if you haven't, if, you're, if your listeners haven't seen it, I'd highly suggest watching the IDEO video on how they redesigned a shopping trolley because oh. that really is, is the essence of what, design thinking should be um i don't believe at large that's what it is today in yeah. most corporate environments i mean a lot of a lot of design shops consultancies creative agencies i mean everyone talks about design thinking yeah. um, at its core it is really understanding what is the actual problem that we're trying to solve mm. not not what's the revenue stream what's the new product that we want to get on the shelf what is the problem that we're trying to solve what do the people who interact with that really care about? Yeah. And let's not operate in this sphere of um, assumption where we'll build a thing and then put it out into the market and say, hey, we think it's a really good idea. What do you think? Because at that point, we've burnt a lot of time and a lot of money doing it. But let's, let's keep that end user as close as we can to that creative process yeah. and put it in front of them, let them play with it, understand what it is that they want. Um, I mean, it, it's human-centered design is very much a, a similar approach in that we we keep the end user um, at the center of everything we do. That's now evolving into humanity-centered design, which are products that aren't just good for individuals but good for people yep. um, at large and, and our community um, at large. I think design thinking is probably an easier one to get your head around. The, the one that, that bugs me a little bit more, and I've had this with a lot of clients is when they say, hey, we want to build an innovation center. And it's like, great. What does that mean? <laughs> <laughs> and they're like, I don't know. We just want to want the center want to, of the innovation. Like, oh, everyone's talking about it. We want innovation. <laughs> and I think it's, it's oh. fantastic. But what we've seen in our experience anyway um, at Isobar is the articulation of what innovation means um, tends to get centralized. So mm. a business will say, hey, we need an innovation hub or we want to build a center of excellence for innovation, mm -hmm. which is really a concentration or a place within the business that money goes in. Mm -hmm. People do really cool, innovative stuff. The business yeah. doesn't really see what comes out in most instances, but we just assume that all the cool stuff that we do comes out of this innovation hub. Yeah. Um, what we're really focusing on now is not innovation as a process or a function, but innovation as a mindset. So it, it should it. sit across the entire organization. In order yep. to do that, of course, you've got to get you've got to get buy-in. You've got to get the, the senior decision makers and stakeholders to understand what the value of innovation is, but also yeah. understand what it really means. It means challenging the status quo, it means finding new ways to solve problems. It it doesn't mean developing new apps. Yep. all the time you know innovation yep. could be i mean fortnite's a great example of innovation in their their billing model yeah you know the game's not particularly innovative but the way that they onboard people onto the platform is relatively new you know they um it's free to play yeah you know? um the first the first taste is free and after that you're hooked and then there's a you know a pricing model um yeah. beyond that you know the, the way that gorilla glass develops screens for for smart devices now is also, you know, that's product innovation because it used to be designed to sustain 
uh, two drops from um, from waist height. But now we're more sedentary. They're starting to to design the glass to be able to sustain seven drops from knee height um, because that's 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 a more common fumbling height now. You know that's yeah. that's innovation. It's not it's not necessarily the cool new thing. Yeah. Sometimes innovation is actually quite invisible um, to the end user, and that's and that's when it can be you know, yeah. most powerful. Um, so I think yeah, innovation is is one of those things that it's really easy to do a seminar on innovation or put together a sales pack on innovation or run a two day workshop on innovation, but yeah, it won't stick. It won't actually demonstrate value on until it becomes a behaviour. Yeah. And I think that's really one of those things that it can't happen in isolation. Like you can't just kind of, you know, redirect all the innovation efforts and thoughts. Um, you certainly can redirect the funds for sure, but you're probably not going to get the ROI that you're expecting if you're, you know, just got a team of people that are doing the innovation, innovative work, but they're not, you know, don't have a finger on the pulse in terms of what the rest of the business is doing. Um, so when it comes to innovation and we're talking about it, it kind of needs to be rolled out as a mindset across all of all business, all people. Mm. You, do you think that there will be a space in the future for innovation to be part of your culture? 100%. So you have a culture of innovation and KPIs around that as well? 100%. Yeah, I, I really yeah. think there, there will be. Um, we're starting to see pockets of it already. Mm. Um, there are, speaking of startups, no longer a startup it's now a multi-billion dollar um, organization but culture amp which was started by didier elzinger who um coincidentally was my ceo when i was at the visual effects company ah, five thousand years ago there you go. um is is focused well it's not focused purely on innovation but it's it's a fantastic tool that doesn't just measure employee engagement um, and, and culture metrics, but actually suggest ways to iteratively improve it, um, to, to make leadership more connected um, with the workforce, to create those pipelines for innovation and conversation and create bottom-up cultures as much as top-down cultures. Um, that's, that's a very, very mature product. The market, I don't think, is fully matured yet to fully embrace the power of products like that but i do see um that it is coming um, so ironically the innovation product <laughs> yes. isn't ready i mean human behavior <laughs> is a really is a really really difficult thing to shift I, I straight out of school um the degree that i did was in behavioral psychology at the university of adelaide and I've, I've brought a lot of that with me in every role um never more so than than now um, but human behavior is, is a very, very complex thing to affect en masse. Individually, yeah, within an organization, incredibly complex. And when, when you touched on KPIs before and the way that we um, measure or value people's input you know, at work, I think those sort of things need to change. Um, things like OKRs, which are outcome and key result driven metrics um, I think a, a really, really good step in the right direction in which it's not about individual targets, but it's about what's the outcome? Have you changed the world? Have you shifted the axis by however many degrees? And that's a success measure. Um, I think those sorts of things really need to find maturity before we can expect innovation to be you know, at the heart and soul of, of organisations. Mm. So if you had to put a time on it, when do you reckon, because I think we've seen, we're seeing an accelerated rate of change across all organisations, um, you know, AI is going to have a huge play in that Absolutely. in the coming, you know, months, years, however long it happens to take. What do you think will happen as a result of, you know, all of the shifts, all of the innovation, all of the change that's happened in 2020? Do you think that innovation is going to um, become more of a priority? I think it will. I absolutely think it will. I think as human beings, we also, you know, we're wired for path of least resistance. So I think we tend to get overexcited by new tech. You know, yeah. um, we thought we all thought we'd have jetpacks and hoverboards by now, right? Um, no, Back so, to the Future really set us up for <laughs> failure, didn't they? It, it did, but you know, I think it, I think it echoes a, a core, um, a core trait. It's we tend to get ahead of ourselves, and we tend to overestimate 
the impact of certain things or our reliance on technology, um, that robots are going to replace us all, we're all going to be out of jobs, that AI is going to do the thinking for us, we're, you know, that, that end scene in, in Wally, we're all in hover chairs drinking Slurpees, you know, that, <laughs> that's... But also that's, goals, so... Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, that's not the immediate reality in, in my estimation, thank goodness. Um, what, I, what, I do think, what I do think is that these sorts of technologies will start to empower us, not replace us. Um, I think there is going to be a, a swing back towards the focus on this is all really, really great in empowering us in productivity and innovation and all these sorts of things, but but what about the core human need? What about mm. satisfaction? What about mm -hmm. um, what is actually assistive to me in my life? What adds value to me in my life? You know, it's not TikTok. That's that's a great <laughs> distraction. You know, my my kids <laughs> tell me for hours just how amazing it is. Um, but I will drag them out into the sunlight and force vitamin D into their bodies. Um, because that's that's where value is, you know. And yeah. I think as society as a whole, we get we get enchanted with all these things, and we we probably allow ourselves to get too far into the rabbit hole. But I, there's perhaps it's the, the optimistic part of me that believes that we will reach a point at which we understand that technology needs to be assistive; otherwise, it's not valuable. Yeah, um, being a distraction is not enough. Yeah, even yeah. you know, making it making my you know, I don't know, whatever it is, I can make a coffee in, you know, in less than five seconds. That's, that's great. But is, is it worth the investment? Do I, do I want to spend a thousand bucks on a machine that does that? You know, is yeah. that really valuable in my life? And I think we're going to start to reassess those things. I agree. And I think there has been a real shift already with people, um, you know, reassessing the convenience versus that connection factor. And I'm excited to see what's going to be coming out from that, because I think that that is, uh, you know, what we're all about, right? You know, where humanity, how do we actually connect at that very human level? Connection's been such a huge thing for so many people that were particularly locked up, locked up <laughs> in lockup. They weren't locked up in jail. They were in, um, you know, locked down. <laughs> very different. That way at times. I bet they did. Yeah. But, you know, the, the resounding, um, I guess, response from the people that I've been talking to to is like you know it was just nice to kind of slow down and um you know be have a bit more of that mindfulness as well so i think that's one of those things that we can't uh you know design like there's no sort of work around for that we are with our own thoughts um so you talked a little bit just earlier around you know having some social impact and i know that that is a very important part of you your own makeup mm -hmm. um so let's talk a little bit around the the startup accelerator that isobar uh, are working on at the moment around that social impact? Um, so Isobar is, um, and I, I don't want to turn this into an ad for Isobar, but one of the things that, that really attracted to me to them as an organization is um, they very much live their values and that's from the, the CEO all the way through to you know, a new starter. Mm -hmm. um, like every organization, they've got a set of values, um, but they're never posters on the wall. They actually, we actually get measured against them. Yeah, right. Um, you know, one of, one of my yours. favorite values is is no bullshit, you know, and you will be assessed on how much you've lived that value. Have you actually told it like it is? Have you had the hard conversations when you needed to? Yeah. Um, have you challenged people in a really, really respectful way? Um, and that attracted me to, to Isobar. I think one of the other things was this, there's a part of the business called Isobar Good, which is predominantly focused, well, purely focused actually on social impact. Yep. Um, and helping our clients drive meaningful social impact. And it's, it's a global arm uh, of the business. It was started um, by a fantastically talented and passionate um, woman, Cara Prosser, out of our Melbourne office. Um, she's now heading that up uh, globally out of the Nordics. Um, and I was lucky enough in, in lockdown to be involved in that, which, which saw me having really, really meaningful conversations with global brands around, well, what can we actually do that's worth a damn? Like we don't want to release a, you know, Shiseido Ranger face masks um, because every brand is, is kind of jumping on that. But, but where can we actually shift the needle? Where can we create something? Sanitizer. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, sanitizer. Yeah. Um, but what, what, makes, what makes sense? What, what is something that 
when all of this is over, people will look back and say, that actually, that actually changed my experience. That actually yeah. made my life better. That, or that helped me when I really needed help, whatever the case may be. Um, and I've always had, as you, as you mentioned briefly, I've always had this really strong social justice streak. Um, you know, I worked in, in the early days with uh, another fantastically um, you know, talented individual on a, I won't call it a charity, but a social impact organization called Spark, um, which was all about identifying change, change makers in their communities globally and, and empowering them, not going in and building schools or dropping off bags of cash or bringing in um, yeah. clean drinking water. All of, all of these things have you know, um, different, different value to, to different communities. But how do we find the people who live in that community, have an idea, and how do we accelerate that idea? Yeah. Um, which I guess is, is not too far removed from startup accelerator thinking. Yeah. Um, I then worked with some former colleagues around an argan oil product, You For Her, um, which employs the same sort of thing, um, finding people within um, their community. In this case, it's, it's um, women in a cooperative uh, in Morocco. Um, how do you create a, a business that empowers them? How do you turn what they've been doing in, for 100 years into something that actually gives them control um, over their own destiny? Um, mm. and help to control the destiny of, of you know, their families as well. Mm. Um, and so being able to have that avenue at, at Isobar has been incredibly gratifying for me, especially because the business values that. So yeah. this accelerator, has, it's, it's really informal. It's come out of a couple of conversations that we've had with um, a couple of um, startup incubators around the country and just been lucky enough to be in the same room and run a couple of sessions with people who are creating amazing products like using virtual reality to, to um, manage um, head trauma and neurological injury rehabilitation. Oh, wow. Yeah, that's and cool. Building carbon accounting software because they want to help businesses get to net zero, you know, carbon emissions. Yeah. <coughs> Pardon me. Um, helping people change the way that they behave around food, um, creating a wholly sustainable carbon neutral, you know, food delivery service that is not about how many meals can we deliver you, but more about every bite you take has impact, um, yeah. not just on you, but on the planet, you know, and yeah. being able to align ourselves with, with visionaries in this space who really, really have a passion for changing things mm. and have direct control because they're in startup space. We don't have huge layers of organizational uh, approval baggage. that we have to work oh. with. <laughs> yeah, all baggage, yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, so we, we're really at, at the coalface working hand in hand with, with these people and these organizations and it's, it's intensely gratifying. Yeah, and yeah. I think it is amazing when you start looking for those startups that are having that that massive, you know, whether it's globally, whether it's nationally, mm -hmm. um, but that social impact and that's the key focus. There is some remarkable stuff um, going on. I read just in the paper the other day here in Adelaide that there's a, a, a new restaurant that's completely waste-free. I don't know how they're doing it, but, you know, like as in I think you can um, get, like instead of getting potato chips, you have deep-fried carrot skins or something along those lines. I'm like, I'm not, I haven't tried it. I can't like, can't be for sure, but you know, it, there's but, all these ideas about how do you reuse food? Yeah. Yeah. And I, I think that's, I think one of the things that became um, a little more pressing in the minds of a lot of people during lockdown was this issue around food security. I mean, we saw mm. unnecessary hoarding. Um, we're, yeah. we're, we're quite self-sufficient as, as a country, we, we produce a lot of the stuff that we see on the shelf. Mm. We're quite fortunate in that way. Um, but this, this issue, well, not this issue, but this concern around food security, especially with um, people traveling less, people sticking to their communities a lot yeah. more. Yeah. Um, we're working with an organization at the moment that is, is solving for that, that is creating what is ostensibly a plug and play um, farm model yep. that you can scale from your 
backyard or your kitchen yeah. um, through to commercial food production. Um, yeah, awesome. You know, and, and there are a few of these around. Um, where we're lucky enough to be working with with one of them that we believe has a really really compelling um, difference in in market in yeah. the way that they're you know building technology into the product itself. Yeah. Um, but it's these sorts of things where you know we're, we're backed into a corner. Um, this is what innovation should really address: is insecurity around food. Okay, great, we can solve for that. Yeah. Or. I want, to, I want to be more conscious about the impact I'm having on the planet with my purchase decisions or the things that I eat or the water that I use or whatever it is, how I operate yeah. as a business. Mm. Great, we can solve for that. Yeah. Uh, that to me is where it's really, really powerful because it, it speaks to a human need. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I love that. I am excited about the return of, you know, trading your lemons for your oranges and a bit of more of that. Oh, really? um, yeah, I think it's great. I would love to see more of that in suburbia. I, I um live in you know metro metro adelaide and i would love to have you know more of that interaction with the community it's been really interesting working from home having families at home um just seeing and getting to know your community a lot more because you know we're all kind of around and this is one of those things that everyone's going through i think it's been amazing yeah. um before we finish up i just wanted to talk about you you uh, briefly mentioned before I hit record around some of the work that you've been doing with uh, UTS, so the University of Tech in Sydney. Yep. Yep. So tell me a little bit about the BCII uh, uh, students that you worked yeah. with. This is really exciting. This is really, really exciting. Well, for me anyway, I geek out on this sort of stuff. Um, so this this is a, a faculty within uh, UTS called BCII, which is the Bachelor of Creative um, uh, creative intelligence, intelligence and innovation and innovation thank you no i wrote um, it down because i thought we might about. have to go back for that acronym yes, <laughs> um and it's it's ostensibly building the system thinker system thinkers and um strategic designers of tomorrow and i know i've just thrown out two buzzwords what i mean <laughs> by that is what what this particular faculty within uts is doing is teaching with equal measure um, entrepreneurship with social impact, with innovation thinking, with robotics, with model thinking and system thinking, which is um, system thinking is, is not looking at a problem in isolation, but understanding the entire system that sits around that and ensuring that whatever you solve for, you're solving for all the factors that influence that as well. Yep. Um, it's, it's like holistic design. It's, it's incredibly important. Um, they're teaching things like third uh, and fourth order thinking and design, which means if I design a solution for something, what impact will that have? And what will be the impact of that thing? And what will be the impact of that thing? So not just thinking yeah. about what I'm designing right now, but what is yep. the flow on of that time over time? Or if I'm looking at things like the pandemic and the rush on toilet paper, mm. Um, well, how do I model that out? What, is, what does that look like going into year two and year three? Does that mean we're suddenly mm. producing a lot more toilet paper? Is there a cliff at some point at which people say, actually, I can't move in my house because I've got so much damn toilet paper <laughs> in here. It's ridiculous. You know, and then <laughs> what's the impact of those things? So yeah. they're really, really teaching an incredibly resilient, robust, broad mindset, yeah. which are, in my mind, especially for for my industry and the things that that I'm looking at, at doing moving into the future, yeah, incredibly valuable people, yeah, um, because you can drop them into anything, and they their thinking goes as wide as possible, yeah, and then we'll converge on a, a whole bunch of potential solutions that consider every single possible yeah. facet, um, yeah. and I think this sort of critical thinking, what we call strategic design. Um, that is become, going to become more and more valuable to organisations, yeah. individuals, councils, um, cities, the world. Yeah, I think I think that's amazing. I'm looking forward to seeing what kind of thinkers come out of those, um, you know, that type of bachelor. Because I think, you know, I think we kind of 
we get taught how to think, don't we? And then at some point we've forgotten that we've got that or um, the autonomy to think and therefore, you know, we've been conditioned to think in such narrow ways and only staying in our lane, so to speak. And then when you're talking about taking those blinkers off and you did with your hands, you know, widen out your hands all the way out to that peripheral, it gives you a completely different perspective and uh, overarching perspective. So where I think there has been a focus in the past on um, specialists, we're going to be finding there's going to be specialist thinkers, but the way that a specialist thinker becomes a specialist is that they can cast their net so wide and be able to go, okay, well, if I pull this lever or move that, that's going to trigger this thing, you know, for departments over on the next um, town here, here and there. Yep. And it's just going to be such a profound, have such a profound impact to really break down that silo thinking and those think, innovation uh, centres. You know, um, I, I don't want to call it myopic design, but I think a lot of what we have created as a culture, as a species, has been relatively short-sighted. Yes. Um, you know, we think about the thing that we want now, not necessarily the, fix the it, long-term yeah. impact of, of what that thing might have. Mm. Um, the, the thing about the next generation of thinkers that I'm hopeful about is that they will start to consider those things at that yeah. point of design. You know, what yeah. will be the, the, the flow-on impact of this? Um, yeah. How sustainable will it be? Yeah. How much value does it really have? And it won't happen across the board. Mm. It'll start to happen in little pockets, but hopefully those pockets will become bigger and bigger and bigger. Mm. Um, and in, in some utopian future, you know, that will be the, that will be the um, predominant way of, of thinking and designing. Well, it's almost full circle then really, isn't it? Because it's like, you know, there'll be thinkers that are thinking about the future and thinking for tomorrow. And then if you think 100 years ago, 200 years ago, uh, early um, settlers, you know, they're planting all sorts, you know, planting trees back then for now. So it's almost like it's, I mean, obviously it's a little bit different, but the thinking rather than that instant gratification or how's it going to help me right now, it'll be how's it going to impact generations to come. I like it. Absolutely. Absolutely. Very cool. All right, your top five tips before we uh, say goodbye. Yeah, here we go. This is going to be a test of uh, you know, strategic thinking, isn't it? Because I said to you, at the beginning, <laughs> I don't have five. I'm going to make them up as I go along. So there's Do my currency for, for this. Um, look, tip number one, um, back yourself, I think. Back yourself. Too yes. often as, as leaders, we, we try and mitigate as much risk as we can. I yep. think don't don't devalue your gut. Just just back yourself and, and, and go for it. And if you fail spectacularly, so be it. But then your behavior comes that you're all in. Yeah. Um, I'm not saying make flippant decisions, but just just commit to stuff and do it. Yeah. Um, I think listen to everybody. Ooh, listen to the crazy. junior who's been with the business for two minutes. Mm-hmm. Um, listen to the person who's been with your organization forever. Uh, yeah. Listen to the guy that makes you coffee. Listen to, um, you know, the the chef that cooks your food. Um, just listen to everybody because no matter what industry you're in, no matter what you do, they're your audience because they're people, mm. um, and they'll interact with a product or a service that you're um, you're involved in the creation of at some point. So mm. listen to people. Um, the third one is. Get comfortable with uncertainty. Yeah. Th- this one's, <laughs> this is something that I've learned in the last couple of years. Um, not always by choice, sometimes by circumstance, but I think the more, especially as, as leaders, the more comfortable we can be with uncertainty, the more resilient we are, yeah. um, which leads me to the fourth thing, which is, even when you don't feel like it, be the steady hand on the chiller for the people that Love it. work for you because they're going to look to you for cues of certainty and stability and reliability. And I think this is something that I learned from um, my CEO at the moment, mm-hmm. Eric Hallander, who had to navigate a very sizable national workforce through COVID. Mm. in an industry in which our three biggest clients going into COVID were Holden, Jetstar and Qantas. Oh, uh, apes. You know, that, that is 
that's a huge leak in the dam to plug. Mm. Um, that is that is huge amounts of anxiety on many fronts, uncertainty mm. on many fronts. Mm. Um, he he navigated that with a really really steady hand. He was that north star. Yeah. Everyone. Um, I think that the last thing, and this is probably a little more personal for me, but I, I think it's it's valuable for, for everyone. Um, be happy when you're proven wrong. Yeah, expand really, on that. Like celebrate it when you're proven wrong because that means you're actually learning something. Yeah. Um, our, our job as leaders is not to always be right. Yeah. Our job as leaders is to always know what the best possible outcome or the best possible piece of advice is. And that's not always going to come from us. We, we yeah. can't be so arrogant as to believe that it, it will. So, yeah, that, I think that's, that's the fifth one for me is the more you're wrong, the more you're learning. Yeah. And, and don't think that you have to hide that vulnerability. I know that feels like it might be in conflict with the previous one, which is about being the steady hand on the tiller. <coughs> Pardon me, um, but it really leverages off the one before that, which was about uncertainty. Now, yeah. If you can demonstrate to your people that you're comfortable with uncertainty, you're comfortable with being wrong, you're yeah. always going to take that and make sure that the best possible circumstances are what you're using going forward, mm-hmm. and you are delivering that steady hand. Yeah, yeah, I love it. That is such a good summary of your top five tips. Amazing. I love the work that you do. <laughs> Thank you. I love it. It's so good. Um, I'll add all of the links in to the show notes for today to for people to hook in and find you. But where do you like to hang out the most? Um, honestly, at home painting or climbing yep. rocks. <laughs> so if you want to come around and, and drink a whiskey and Are you talking about up, bouldering? Yeah, I'm talking or, about bouldering. Yeah, right. Uh, or come and climb some stuff. Uh, look, otherwise, I'm I'm intentionally trying to not rely on socials too much. Yeah. So Good for um, you. look, hit hit me up on LinkedIn, send me yep. a, a DM on LinkedIn and I'll always respond within 24 hours. Oh. Um, yeah, I think that's that's probably where I try and contain contact that's uh, not directly work related. Yes, LinkedIn's yeah. my favorite place to play too. Well, thank you so much for your time. I uh, I can't wait to see what the future thinkers have in store for us in the future. And uh, I'm sure you're going to have a massive impact on those up and coming students at UTS as well. So thank you very much from Future Ali. Pleasure. Thanks, Ali. All right. Catch you.